if you agree with Badiou that the two central and most difficult concepts in Lacanian psychoanalysis are the one and love, you're in good stead here at the start of chapter 8 of seminar 16, where the most difficult thing to think about is the one. And then Lacan, in the same paragraph, dips down to talk about the unary trait, the subject's identification with this unary trait, and then he's on to repetition, this other key concept in his thought from this period. Now, my thinking here is that we might need to slow down just a little bit now that the one is before us. Now that the unary trait is introduced, you've heard us mention it here a couple of times, um, let's go ahead and focus on some of these terms. And we are still thinking about the topology of the subject, and I want to focus on each of those elements in there. We've been talking a little bit about them. We've got some other elements that we might want to add, some more connections to flesh out. And the truth is, is that these are all central concepts in Lacan's thought. Um, and each of these elements of the topology of the subject that he's developing in 16 is going to feed into the four discourses that he develops in seminar 17. Um, so let's see if we can put some sharper points on these elements in his topology of the subject. Uh, the same topology that, according to Lacan, uh, commands or dictates how we access enjoyment. So the stakes are kind of high, and all the more so as Lacan blasts forward here into some new uh, concepts here with the notion of the one. Now, it's not new to us entirely, but here he is renewing this concept for us to consider. Uh, we've talked about the one before, really ever since uh, Seminar 11, the one has been on on his radar and also ours. Let's start with one of the basic concepts, arguably the foundational concept, maybe even the easiest concept in the topology of the subject. Now you'll recall we start with a basic hypothesis. The signifier is what represents the subject to another signifier. There's our hypothesis. And then we plug this into a, a topology where you see S1, there's the signifier that represents over the barred subject, the subject that it represents, with a little arrow pointing to S2. This S2 is what we want to start with. It's an excised subset of the big other, in which subjects are extinguished as soon as they appear. Lacan uses the term knowledge here for S2, but for our purposes, what matters here is that it's a subset of the big other. It's not equivalent to the big other. It is an excised subset of the big other. And it's just as hell-bent on consistency and completion as the big other is, albeit strictly at the level of its specific discursive field. Now, let's take some examples of this. How about unified theories? And here what I'm thinking of here are unified theories of X, Y, Z, all of which are attempting to explain multiple phenomena under a single framework. General relativity, a unified theory. String theory, a unified theory. Anytime you have a subset of the big other that purports to unify, to make one and coherent, whatever it is, whatever is the specific um, uh, field of its discourse, you see S2 at work. Um, you can see this all over the place in various books. The OED is an S2. How to cook everything. Cookbooks are great for tracking down S2s. It's like we're going to give you every single recipe of a certain cuisine on a certain theme, and here's the book. If you just get this book, you'll have everything. Um, how about everything you always wanted to know about Lacan, but were afraid to ask Hitchcock? There's an S2 for you. Moving on. I'd say the next big element in the topology of the subject that we should take a look at is the barred other. It's tricky as hell, and we're not going to have the final word on this matter, not for this seminar and not for any of our future series. But let's see what we can do, what we've got so far, and what we can add to it. What is the barred other in this topology of the subject that's then going to become the basis for the four discourses that Lacan develops in 17? The barred other, as we've discussed it, 
is an ever incomplete, strictly virtual, totalizing operation. Not the topology of the subject, but its progressive encompassment in endless iterations of itself, as seen in our second diagram, the second diagram that we developed in this series, where you see the topology of the subject being encompassed by another topology of the subject, and another, and another, and another. That is the barred other. If the big other lacks, it also desires. Now we know why it lacks, and thus why it desires. But what exactly does the big other want? You've heard me say it before, absolute containment. Or put a bit more archly, to become a master signifier without remainder. If the big other has a desire, that's it. It wants to become a master signifier without remainder. Thankfully, um, this destiny of the big other is destined to fail. Um, and instead, the big other winds up attaching itself to a different signifier. Not a master signifier without remainder, but the signifier uh, of the barred other itself. This is not a signifier of mastery and completion, but instead a signifier of lack and inconsistency. A signifier to which the barred subject, Lacan tells us, is stuck. The symbol for this in Lacan's algebra, as you know, is in the upper left-hand quadrant of the graph of desire, a signifier of the barred other. What exactly does the big other lack? In short, us. You, me, us. What keeps dropping out from its fraught and thus perpetual operation is the barred subject. How does this relate, then, to the logical, structural lack in the big other that we've been talking about? The lack which allows us to say things like, there is no other of the other. It's simple. What the big other lacks is a subjugated relation to the big other like the one which defines you and me as split subjects. Hence, the big other's kinship with the master, whose deluded, lonely as hell, and ultimately tragic life depends on the enslavement of everyone and everything except themselves. Let's talk about the barred subject. This is in the lower left-hand side of the topology of the subject that we've been working with. What is the barred subject? It's an iterative, non-identical, anti-universal, adhesively real remainder, byproduct, entropic leftover, it's waste, baby, of the barred other's push for absolute containment. It's what the barred other keeps shitting out and then trying to stuff back inside itself. The ever elusive figure stuck to the bottom of the signifier, here S1, that functions as the cause of the other's desire, that is the barred subject. It's stuck to the bottom of the S1 that is the cause of the big other's desire. We'll come to that in a minute. You heard me talk about this in terms of one of my cats, Lucifer. What's not covered or contained by the signifier Lucifer gets picked up, covered by the signifier Mittens, which is another name we use for her. Now, that signification of her, though, leaves something more, something else, some part of her lived experience in this household that is unaccounted for. And we've got another signifier to account for what's left behind there. But that one also comes up short. We can keep going. You get the idea. Yet another reason why the split subject's relation to the barred other is, hear me now, non-reciprocal. The barred other lacks the split subject. But the split subject does not lack the barred other. This is key. The implications for this non-reciprocity are profound. First and foremost, it means that the superimpositions of lack that we discussed in our series on Seminar 11 and at the drive are more complex and variable 
than we suggested at the time. The symbolic lack of alienation, as we saw, it duplicates the real lack of sexuation. And this is a point that's made especially clear when you consider their shared kinship with death. The relationship that the real lack of sexuation puts us as living beings into with death is reduplicated at the level of symbolic alienation. Which is why Lacan is pretty keen to talk about how the signifier is closely connected with death. It's tinged with death, not unlike us when we're first born. Nothing changes there. But notice what this insight gives us with regard to the third lack, the lack that comes up through the process of separation in Lacan's thought. The superimposition of two lacks, that of the subject and that of the big other, that Lacan connects to the experience of separation in Seminar 11, around page like 210, 214, 215, around in there. If the barred other lacks the split subject, but the split subject doesn't lack the barred other, these lacks are not duplicative, but instead differential. Now here in Seminar 16, which of course we're reading in the wake of Seminar 14, we arrive at another insight. If the split subject does not lack the barred other, it's because the barred other is all we've ever known, hence anxiety, but also the fundamental fantasy that we all too often use to ward anxiety off. It's precisely because we're continually bombarded with the lack of the other, that we're tempted to imagine the big other as whole, complete, consistent instead. We know all too well that the other doesn't exist, which is exactly why we're inclined to believe the opposite. Now let's get to the Matthema fantasy. We've been talking about this a little bit. It usually reads, a split subject living their life in relation to what they imagine avatars of the big other to lack, and thus to desire. And what the big other desires, we now know, is absolute containment. Now let's add these two up and see what we can say. Here's what I would suggest. We can reread the Matthew of fantasy, or at least extend it a bit to read as follows. I am what you, the big other, lack. But you are not what I lack. What I lack is also what my very existence as a split subject prevents you from becoming. Not the barred other which you are, and let me tell you, shall always be, but the whole, complete, consistent, absolute other on which all of your big other tireless totalizing efforts are based. In other words, and let's be pointed here. I want what you want, dear big other. Namely, I want for you to be the big other that you simply are not. It's because I know God doesn't exist that I continue to believe he does. Now, there's something kind of perverse about all this if you think about it especially when you consider that it's us as split subjects that effectively keeps the barred other from realizing its desire for absolute containment. Think about this for a second. Were we to venture some kind of formula here, the same way we ventured a formula for the signifier of the barred other in previous lectures in the series, maybe we could come up with one for the signifier of the split subject. We might say, that the signifier of the split subject is a paradoxical set comprised of S1, S2, and the split subject itself, a plus one of sorts in place of the minus one that we installed at the end of our formula for the signifier of the barred other. So you recall the formula for the signifier of the barred other, it ends in a subtraction of the barred subject. The signifier of the split subject would be an addition instead. But let me tell you, beware the lure of the imaginary phallus. <laughs>
which is right where this puts us. You may be what the big other in your life lacks, but you sure as hell can't make them whole. I'm going to pause there and move on. We've got two more concepts I want to draw out, and all as preliminary remarks before we jump into this one that we're getting um, here at the beginning of chapter 8. Little a. Little a at this point in Seminar 16 does not have a huge role to play. And you'll notice if you know the baseline for the discourse that Lacan then develops into his four discourses, that little a kind of pops up in the bottom right-hand quadrant a little bit later. Right now, he's still trying to figure out where this thing fits, or at least withholding that information from us as we move forward. It kind of depends on what kind of big other you think Lacan is. Is he a whole, complete big other, in which case he knows damn well where the little a goes and he's just withholding it from us? Hmm. Demand anyone? Or is he himself trying to figure out where it goes? In other words, not a big other, but a barred other. It's interesting to see where Lacanians align themselves relative to the so-called master himself. We'll pause on that for a second and get back to this little a. And let's see what we know about it so far in this seminar. Little a, if we had to define it at this point in seminar 16, is the operative bar between S1 and the split subject in the topology that we're discussing. It's an operative bar that distinguishes at once marking and maintaining the split subject as a real corporal remainder, entropic through and through of the big other's fraught quest for absolute containment. I think we can say that. Um, Lacan uses the word index too, so let's see if we can make use of that one. Little a at this point is the index of a basic structural disjunction, a foundational non-rapport, if you like to read ahead into the 19 and the 20 and the so forth, a non-rapport between the barred subject and the barred other. And that's pretty key here. In fact, I think that's the, the central conceptual thing to work out in the topology of the subject. What's the subject's relationship to the barred other? In the math theme of fantasy, little a might be the site of the I that so interests Lacan here in the opening chapters of Seminar 16, especially around Pascal's wager, which we've been discussing. But I would exercise some caution here because I think the I in question, as you've heard me say, may also be exactly what puts the one in S1. And remember, all of this is starting with that opening line in chapter 8. The most difficult thing to think about is the one. And that's where I want to end this little bit of review, this little compilation of sorts, this kind of tacking on to what we already know about these basic elements in the topology of the subject, here bringing us right to the major one, the S1. What is S1? And I think this one is really important to get figured out before we take next steps into what Lacan does here in chapter eight. S1 is the primordial signifier of the barred subject, as seen in the topology of the subject here. But here's what I would add. It is also the primordial signifier of the barred other, as seen again in the upper left-hand quadrant of the graph of desire. And I think this is partly why it's so difficult to situate S1, as Lacan says here in 16. It's tough to figure out how S1 plays. Let me see if I can say something about how that is all working out here. Because when you look in the secondary literatures, there is oftentimes some slippage between S1 and several other terms. You can kind of like pencil it all out, and you've got like five or six terms that get glommed onto the S1. Here, at this point, let's see what we can make of this thing. The closer you get to the barred subject, the more S1 functions as the unary trait, which is also something Lacan reacquaints us with or attempts to here at the start of chapter 8. The closer you get to the barred subject, the more S1 functions as the unary trait. Now, this is a singular, unique, defining signifier of someone's personal identity. 
and it's usually caught up in their sense of self-worth. It's a signifier internalized and integrated. Lacan even calls it the nucleus of one's ego ideal. Not ideal ego, but ego ideal, symbolized in Lacanian algebra by a capital I next to a big A in parens, bottom left-hand quadrant of the graph of desire. If the I puts the one in S1, as you heard me say, I would add this. It's S1 that puts the I in the algebraic symbol for the ego ideal, that big I next to parens, big A. Now, let's take the other side of this. Let's say you move away from the split subject, the barred subject, in the topology of the subject we're considering, and you start to zoom out, head back in the direction of S2, which we know is an XI subset from the big other. In other words, what happens when S1 gets closer to the big other, the barred other here? The closer you get to the barred other, the more S1 doesn't function as the unary trait, but instead as a master signifier. And that's the wager here that I'm putting forth. The closer you move towards the split subject, the more S1 functions as a unary trait. The closer you move S1 in the direction of the barred other, the more it functions as a master signifier. And here it would be a signifier that founds, figures, and in keeping with what we're doing here at the start of uh, chapter eight, it oneifies. It makes one of, it operationalizes a collection as a one. And it's a collection of people, of entities, of events. Pick your collection, recipes, feel me? It gives each of these collections a sense of shared identity and meaning. So it's interesting. The unary trait when S1 functions as it is coupled with individual identity, personal senses of self, wrapped up always with an ego ideal. However, S1 is also working with the barred other. And here it moves from an individual, personal function to a more collective, collectivizing function, more of a social function as master signifier, not unary trait. And I think that's a really nice conceptual piece to work out here. What ultimately is the difference between the unary trait and the master signifier? S1 can perform both functions at this point, and I think we now have a sense of what that difference is. Let's keep going, though. If you've got these two functions, S1 is unary trait and hooked into personal identity, S1 is master signifier and hooked into collective identity, how do these two functions relate in the topology of the subject? Let's try it out. Here's what I would say. As a master signifier, S1 designates a singular breakaway radically excised element of the subset of the big other known as S2. This designation not only allows it to signify the lack in the other, here S next to the barred other, but it also allows it to be isolated as someone's unary trait and internalized as the nucleus of their ego ideal, big I next to parens full A. Let me tell you, man, there's a diagram that I would love to see somebody trace out. A diagram waiting to be drawn, or maybe it's already been drawn, or I don't even know about it yet. S1 as the logical joint, a joining of sorts, if you're into symbolic logic, between the barred other and the ego ideal. All right, we're here with chapter eight in seminar 16, and we were just defining some key terms, ending with this S1, this very difficult to situate element known as S1. Um, as we know, at the start of chapter eight, the most difficult thing to think about, according to Lacan, is the one. It's the opening sentence in this chapter. As you read through this chapter, though, I think it emerges that there are two ones that he's thinking about here. There's first that of the split subject, um, here in the form of the unary trait. The unary trait is the one that relates to the split subject, which we'll talk about. The other is the one that relates to uh, the barred other. And you could think of this as um, the promised wholeness, um, 
completion, universalization, or in other words, oneification, the absolute totality that the big other seeks is another kind of one, a oneness um, that it hopes to effect. And that's just it here. In both cases, whether as unary trait or as oneness, we see the one is an effect. Um, it's more of an operational result in each case than it is a pre-existing element or entity. The one relative to the split subject in the form of the unary trait is an effect, much as the oneness of absolute containment that the big other pursues is also an effect. And what Lacan's trying to do in this chapter, it seems to me, is measure this, these effects. And they're intertwined, too, and that's why it gets complicated, I believe, is that he's trying to suggest that there's an intertwinement of these two onenesses that have to be somehow teased apart. But here, in chapter 8, they're still kind of jumbled together. So we're going to see if we can make some sense of this. I would say start by checking out page 11 in this chapter. And it's just underneath the, the little uh, diagram that the tra looks like the translators have reconstructed somewhat on page 11. Um, in that paragraph below it, where he's got his O2s and his O's and so forth, um, look at that last bit in the, in the last sentence here. The measure of this field of the other as one, namely something different from its pure and simple inscription as unary trait. So here are the two ones being separated out pretty clearly for us. He's trying to figure out a way to take the measure of the field of the big other as a kind of one, as a oneness that results from the big other's totalizing count or at least that is promised by the big other's totalizing count. And then this something different from this, another type of oneness, um, the pure and simple inscription of the unary trait that the barred subject receives in many ways from the big other. <clears throat> so let's just keep an eye on this. Page 11, though, is a good place to start. Um, let's now talk about the oneness that is the um, hoped for effect of the big other's totalizing count. This is the easiest one for us to discuss because coming out of our series on seminar 14, we have a good sense structurally, logically, of how this one plays out. Um, notice how it's coming up here, though, in seminar 16. Back up from page 11 and go to page 8. And you'll see what I'm up to here. Page 8 is nice because it's before you get to all the elaborate counting games and sequences, these concatenations that Lacan wants to put us through. Um, and he says pretty clearly here what he's up to. He's looking for a, a mathematical model or a mapping for the big other that would allow him to connect a series of ones and zeros. You can see it in the middle of the page where he says 1 over O, which for us is little a, so 1 over little a equals 1 plus a. It's right there on page 8, and it's one of his guiding sensibilities that he's going to carry forward into the other numerical work that he's doing here. The point is, is that if the big other as 1 exists, which it does not, the way to understand it is that its oneness, its pursuit of oneness is always undermined, undergirded by something that divides it. Here, a little a. Something is lacking that is always outside and dividing the big other. So in order for the big other to account for this, it has to always add this lack to its totalizing count. So it's one, it's everything, always has a plus sign attached to it, plus this other thing that has to be excluded from the totalizing count of everything in order for that count to be valid. 
and authoritative. Now, we've talked about this before. We're going to talk about it a little bit more today. There's nothing new here. Lacan wasn't the first person to talk about this, and believe it or not, it wasn't set theory that gave us this idea. The Western tradition, the great source for this thinking, is actually social theory, and not just any social theory. It was the work of Soren Kierkegaard in the mid-19th century when he's theorizing the public as an all and nothing entity. You can see this traced out in the early chapters of The Chattering Mind. Uh, but that's partly what's happening here, is long before Badiou, before Lacan, before set theory, you've got Soren Kierkegaard cracking this nut at the level of a social theory, in this case, his theory of the public, which would, of course, then inform Heidegger and so forth. So you have in Kierkegaard's writings in the 1840s a real epicenter of thought. Don't forget, set theory doesn't start popping until the 1870s. Okay, intellectual history aside, we're working here with this big other. Now let's see what we can make of it. Chapter 8, page 13. You'll notice we stay pretty close to the text here. Lacan's doing some wild thinking, and it's important for us to see if we can follow along. And looking always for those moments where the thought crystallizes, and I think we see one on page 13. Page 13 of chapter 8. The paragraph begins, only we see this important thing. I think this is arguably the most important paragraph in this chapter. <clears throat> Let's read it. Starting in that first line, only we see this important thing, which is that, and here we go, in all the cases that we choose, even when it is nothing that we lose, we are deprived of a semi-infinite. Now, the most important part there is this nothing. And that's what we know about the big other's totalizing count. In order for its account of everything to be complete, Nothing has to be left out. Nothing has to be excluded. Nothing has to be lost. And Lacan's point, you've heard me say it before, is that this nothing that is necessarily logically excluded from the big other's totalizing account of everything is itself an entity to be studied. Not just as its lack the lack of the big other, but also as an entity on top which you can build an entire mode of inquiry known as psychoanalysis. But back to this page. Nothing gets lost. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left behind. And you've heard me say it with the illustration again of going on a trip. And you get in the car. And you're going on this advanced camping. Maybe you're going up to the mountains. Maybe you're going on holiday. Whatever the hell it is. And you get in the car. And you ask your friend, your partner, whoever's going with you, um, did you pack this? Yes. Did you pack that? Yes. Did you get the thing? Yes, I got the thing. And you ask the questions, and eventually they say, um, listen, everything is packed. Everything is here. At which point you turn to them and you say, stop the car, turn around. Nothing has been left behind. In order for everything to be included in the car, packed and ready for the trip, nothing has to be left behind. Nothing is excluded from every totalizing count. And the joke here, of course, is that that nothing is in fact something that if indeed you've packed everything, should also be in the car. So turn around, let's go back and get it. <clears throat> you've heard this joke from me before, so I won't spend much time with it. Next sentence. This corresponds to the field of the big other, and in the way that we can precisely measure it as one by means of the loss. So remember, he's trying to figure out a way of measuring the oneness of the big other as goal, as infinite horizon. And what he wants to say is that we can start to measure the one that is the big other, which is always, of course, the lack of one because the count is never complete for reasons we've been discussing, by means of the loss. And that's what that one plus A indicates, is that the oneness that the big other hopes to affect is always a one plus something else. Here, the something which is nothing that is always excluded from the count. So it's kind of a logical puzzle that Lacan keeps returning to here. But he wants to say you can measure the big other's totalizing count 
by means of what is lost or left out from this count. As regards the genesis of this other, this big other, if it is true that we can distinguish it from the one before the one, so here again, you're starting to get two different versions of the one popping. The one before the one. So there's some one that was before the big other's attempt to oneify, to universalize the world. Namely, enjoyment. The one before the one. Now, think how this is going to connect to the unary trait. <clears throat> has to do with enjoyment. You see that by having affirmed the one plus O or one plus A in our, in our English, by having done the addition of it with infinite care, it is indeed about A, little a, in its relationship to one. So there's that one plus A again. You can think of this mathematically too as saying one plus zero. Now if you run the math, it's simple. One plus zero equals one. But Lacan's math, like Kierkegaard's before him, is fuzzy math. For Lacan, one plus zero doesn't equal one. He'd say it equals two because zero is another entity to be counted. Now, a Lacanian is going to say, actually, no, there's three. There's the one, there's the zero, and then there is the disjunction or the relationship between them marked by the plus sign. And that traditionally would be objet a, the one plus one equals three that you oftentimes hear me talking about. But here, pointedly, remember, basic math tells us one plus zero equals one. Lacan is saying, no, fundamentally it equals three because the relationship between one and zero is an element, the one is an element, and the zero is also something to be counted. For here, though, that zero is important to understanding how we measure the big other. The big other as a, as a category, as an entity to be measured, requires some fuzzy mathematical thought. It is indeed about A or zero in its relation to one, namely about this lack that we have received from the other. Okay, now we're starting to get to the unary trait a lack that is received from the other. In other words, we as subjects have received this. Hold off on that. We'll come to it in a minute. As compared to what we can build up as the complete field of the other. So there again, you see this distinction between a one that is delivered to us as barred subjects from the big other and this oneness that marks the field of the big other, if only aspirationally. That's why he says, as compared to. In other words, he's telling us there's two different kinds here. There's the one that we receive from the other in the form of lack, which we'll talk about. And then there is what we can build up as the complete field of the other, another sense of one, a oneification that the big other seeks. It is from there, from the little a, and in an analogical fashion, that we can hope to take the measure of what is involved in the one of enjoyment with respect precisely to the sum that is supposedly realized. So we've got some elements here. Uh, bracket for a moment the question of enjoyment as this one before the oneification um, effected by the big other. Remember too how we have mathematized castration. Castration is phi minus phi equals a. Now, the way that we've written that mathematically is to just say 1 minus 1 equals 0. So phi, the imaginary object, is a 1. Castration, always symbolized by the minus phi, is a negative 1. 1 minus 1 equals or results in, leaves us with lack. Zero is a placeholder that marks the absence of something. But also, Lacan's point is zero marks the presence of an absence. It shows you where something isn't. 
So 1 minus 1 equals 0, the same way that phi minus phi equals a, or results in a might be even better. <clears throat> and again, the point here with regard to the big other is that this a, this 0, is always something that has to be added to its totalizing count. <clears throat> Let's pause there. So again, if we want a mathematical equation, we can say the big other equals one plus a, and that a can be a zero. Um, the reason why we write that is because the one in this mathematical formula, think of that as completion. Think of that as containment, absolute containment, oneness. Everything is brought together, held together, universalized, created as a universe, a oneness. Everything hangs together. Ah, but there's just one other thing that has to be added to that. If the one marks the everything that the big other seeks, the little a, here is little o, which is just a zero effectively, shows us that there's always something missing from that count. Namely, <clears throat> nothing. Nothing, again, has to be excluded from the totalizing count of everything in order for that count to hold. And that's what Lacan is working with here, time and time again in the 1960s, is working out the nothing that is necessarily, logically, structurally excluded from any account that is totalizing, that claims to account for everything. So the big other equals one plus little a, or one plus zero. You could say that what that means is the big other equals everything plus nothing. And this is exactly how, again, Soren Kierkegaard defines the public. It is all and nothing. <clears throat> all right. With that summary in mind, let's see what we can do to hook this in to the other things we've been working on in chapter eight here. We've got a couple of S1s popping. What we're looking at now is the prospect of an S1 that would be a master signifier vis-a-vis -vis the big other, the barred other. A master signifier whose exclusion from the big other's totalizing account is precisely what allows this count to operate and allows this S1 to serve as its master signifier. Namely here what we're looking at in the figure of nothing, of zero, marked by the little a here in Lacan's thought, is a signifier that conditions the big other's collectivization, its oneification, its universalization, or at least the dream of oneness, the dream of completion, the dream of containment that we see as basically the fundamental fantasy of ourselves, but also of the big other. Remember, I want what you want, dear big other, namely for you to be anything but barred. The only thing you could be other than barred, which is whole, complete. We want what the big other wants too. <clears throat> In order for that count to be authoritative, something has to be left out, which is kind of the great irony here. The great paradox of every totalizing count is that in order for it to be operational, something has to be left out, a something which is nothing relative to that count. <clears throat> Again, we've seen this logic before. Nothing has to be left out, left behind, excluded from the big other's count of everything in order for that count to be authoritative. That's it. The completion that the big other seeks, in other words, requires, mandates, necessitates a continual incompletion. <clears throat> and what is this nothing? It's a no thing, as you've heard me say before. And this is partly how it brings us to the unary trait. The nothing that is excluded from the big other's totalizing count, its pursuit, its dream of absolute containment, is a no thing relative to us. <clears throat> and it traces its origin relative to us, 
to the basic no that is the first moment in the name of the Father. Here we're working around that theme of phi minus phi equals a, or results in a. 1 minus 1 equals 0. And we're working around what this means for us as barred subjects. <clears throat> Hence this second unary trait, this other way, the second S1 that we've been looking at as unary trait for split subjects like ourselves. Um, what is this S1 as unary trait? that we receive from the big other that is somehow connected to the master signifier that conditions its operation. Um, what we know is that it's an insignia, a collection of insignia perhaps, but usually one. That's what Lacan's after here is that single element, that single stroke, that part of the avatar of the big other that we internalize as split subjects. He's getting this from Freud. <clears throat> An insignia or a symbol, a signifier of the big other, or at least one of its avatars, to be interjected and integrated into one's sense of self. So here again, you see that the master signifier relative to the big other is one that allows for a collective identity, a collective oneification. And that's exactly what the big other is about. It is about the production and maintenance of a collective identity of sorts. Pick your collection, but the idea is to have it as complete as possible. That's what the big other is after. And its master signifier is this element that is always being um, shunted from that count, subtracted, left out. <clears throat> Here at the level of the unary trait, what we're seeing is not about the maintenance of a collectivity, but instead about the production of an individuality, of oneself. The unary trait is in each case a signal or a signifier of an avatar of the big other that we introject as individuals, bring into ourselves, appropriate and absorb into our sense of self. Um, and what I'm after here is something a little more complex than just saying this results in an ego ideal. I want to add something more to this. <clears throat> what I would like to say is that the unary trait is itself not singular. The unary trait, I would suggest, is a set comprised of two elements. So very similar to the move that you heard us make in Seminar 11, in our series on Seminar 11, and really going forward here is that the experience of lack doesn't equal little a. Little a doesn't simply symbolize the experience of lack. The experience of lack is a composite moment comprised of two basic events. The first is the cut or the incision of castration symbolized by minus phi. That's the element of loss. And that precedes the experience of lack marked by little a. The experience of lack is, the, is, is, is like living with an opening or a wound, but that opening or that wound presupposes an incision or a cut, a separate act in which that wound was inflicted. Now we can bracket the question of on what that wound is inflicted and just focus on the fact that structurally, as we're thinking here, lack is a set comprised of two elements, minus V at the level of loss and little a at the level of lack. I want to do something similar here with the S1 that is the unary trait that is internalized and introjected into the split subject's sense of self. And what I want to do is suggest that this unary trait is comprised of two elements. It's a set comprised of two elements. And each of these elements results in a different ego formation, a different part of self. Here again, S1 is about personal identity, more than collective identity. I want to suggest that the ego ideal isn't the only formation of self to result from the unary trait we receive, the one that we receive from the big other, which we're going to discuss. There's also the superego, 
as well. And it's going to be tricky to demonstrate this, and it'll be experimental and tentative to demonstrate this, but I think we can do it, maybe with the help of some diagram work. Now you see the black screen here in front of you because we're about to do some diagram work. But first, let's get back to where this discussion started with that first line in chapter eight, because it's going to give us some orientation in terms of how to build the diagrams we want to build, experimentally, of course, because we're trying to sort out a complex little rat's nest of concepts where S1 doubles as master signifier, but also as unary trait, where the unary trait is, in fact, a set comprised of two elements and so on. So let's hold tight with the passages that we've looked at and add one more. We're finally ready to read that first paragraph, the opening paragraph in chapter eight, seminar 16. The most difficult thing to think about is the one. Now, let's see where he goes with this. That people strive to do so is not new. The modern approach is scripturist, there was a day when I extracted, to the astonishment I remember, of one of my listeners who marveled at it. Ah, how did you manage to get your hands on that Einziger Zug, which I translated in a way that has lasted as the unary trait. It is in effect the term with which Freud pinpoints one of the forms of what he calls identification. <clears throat> I showed at that time in a sufficiently developed way for me not to have to come back to it today, except simply to recall that in this trait there is the essential of the effect of what for us analysts, namely, in the field we have to deal with, the subject namely, is called repetition. <clears throat> so there's some connection here, bracketing the scripturist stuff, we don't need that, the Freud stuff you can read on your own, it's nothing fancy. But something here about the unary trait as an effect of sorts, an effect of the process of repetition that again is so key and central in Lacan's thought in the 1960s. Now we can go on reading, but I think this gives us enough to start. Although, look at the next paragraph on page one. This thing that I did not invent but which is said in Freud, provided only one pays attention to what he says, this is linked in a way that one can call determining to a consequence that he designates as the lost object. So it's a further element that we could add here. Something about the S1 marks it as a lost object. Something about the unary trait as S1 marks it as a lost object that is a consequence loss as a consequence, as an effect of something. Here, an object that is lost as an effect of another operation. Essentially, to summarize, it is in the fact that enjoyment is aimed at in an effort of rediscoveries and that it can only be so by being recognized by the effect of the mark that this mark itself introduces into it a blemish from which this loss results. So there's something about the lost origin that is blemished. And this is gonna be important as well. Loss here is an effect, is a consequence. And you see this term popping up again and again <clears throat> in this section of, of seminar 16. And somehow the effect of repetition, which as we know is retroactive, is going to be a mark introducing a blemish in the origin of some kind, an origin of the act of repetition. What this origin was before it was marked as such is now gone, is now lost. So the question is not so much what was there before, but how is that figured from a later date retroactively? How is it repeated at a later date? And this is important here because Repetition for Lacan is always retroactive. It has to be. If I ask you, for instance, what was your first job? It implies that you've had other jobs since then. In order for there to be a first, there has to, in a word, first be a second. 
And if not, you would say something like, oh, I don't know. If you've only had one job, you might say my first and my only job. And this was that you had one job and it was the job you had for your entire career. Um, but listen, though, you don't need to add first. If you've only had one job, there is no first and there is no second. Lacan's point is you can't have a first unless there is a second to follow. And that's the truth of repetition, is that it always retroactively marks some entity or ev event as the first instance. But when that entity or event was popping in the past, it was not the first of anything, you see? It's only after it is repeated that it can be retroactively designated as the origin, in this case, of a repetition. Not the genesis, but the origin of a repetition. So this is what we're toying with here. And again, we've got the blackboard in front of us because we're going to try and do some diagram work to demonstrate some of this stuff. <clears throat> now, you can see this in theories of repression and return of the repressed that we've gone over. It's the same modeling that we see at work in Lacan's first and arguably most famous topology of the subject in his subversion of the subject essay. <clears throat> we don't need to mess around with it too much here, but it will be worth redrawing because I believe that this more famous topology of the subject has a kinship of sorts with what Lacan is doing with the topology of the subject here in seminar 16. So let's start with that and see what we can do to trace this out. Now, the topology of the subject that we're working with here, it looks something like this. S1, part subject, there you have it. We can draw it a little cleaner even. The signifier is what represents the subject to, for, another signifier. This is what we've got so far, the Seminar 16 topology. Now, prior to this, Lacan had some other topologies of the subject. You see this in the subversion of the subject essay. This would be the big other as a treasure trove of signifiers. We're not going to spend much time with this because we've spent so much time elsewhere going over it. But we are going to go ahead and draw this diagram a couple of times to show you how it might map on to the topology of the subject that we see in 16. And remember, we're just messing around here. This first one that I'm going to draw is what I would call a topology of subjugation. And here what you see is a subject of pure need being transformed into a split subject. If you're curious about how this unfolds, um, check out our series on the subversion of the subject essay. It's in podcast form and also available on YouTube, I believe. Um, so I'm going to be moving fast here and say that part of what's happening in this first model of subjugation is that the subject of pure need as an infant, as a biomaterialistic being, is being filtered through, subordinated to, and split by the field of language. And that's what this arrow, this lateral arrow means here. Here is the treasure trove of possible meanings that the big other or primary caregiver could assign to the child's cry. And then here, in fact, are the specific interpretations that the big other brings to it. This is a lowercase italicized s, meaning signified. So the baby cries. You have some options. You could bring it food. You could bring it water. You could bring it a blanket. You could change its diaper. And then you choose one. Uh, I'm going to try to change the diaper. That's the signified according to your interpretation. Over time, what the child learns is that when it cries a certain way, it gets a diaper, perhaps, or some other entity. And it winds up split between its biomaterialistic self and the part of it that must be mediated through language in order to have its demands met. And that's just it. Down here, the subject of pure need is driven by a logic of need. Once it passes through the defiles of the signifier here, it now transforms into a demand. 
That's what demand is. A demand is a need mediated through language, and that's the split subject in this early sense. It's torn between the logics of need that condition its bioanimality and the logics of demand that inscribe it as a sociolinguistic being. Again, we're not going to spend much time with this. We're just going to pass through here. The important part is that it's a logic of subjugation. This is a, an experience of prohibition by the symbolic. The field of language, the symbolic, is experienced as a kind of prohibition. You no longer get to keep crying and have your needs met. You now have to use words. That prohibition by the symbolic, it results in what I would call the superego. This is one of the ego formations that emerges from this process. It's not the only one, but it's a key one, the superego. We don't really have an algebraic term for this. It's interesting. In Lacanian algebra, we just don't have a term for this. We know that the ego ideal is capital I, A, and parens. So what could we offer here in terms of the superego? We could put a big P in front of this, prohibition, by or according to the big other. Maybe we might put a big S in front of it, superego, instead of ideal ego, or ego ideal. I don't know what letter you'd want to put in front of this. Um, how about just a big S to keep things extra confusing? Let's add another S in our um, algebraic term for the superego. And remember, we're thinking out loud here. We're experimenting with this stuff. <clears throat> What Lacan does in the subversion of the subject essay is he then transforms this model, this early topology of the subject. And what he wants to do is keep the big other where it is, maintain meaning according to the big other. It has the same basic structure, but what he wants to do is he wants to slide the split subject over to this side. And so you've got the split subject down here instead of that of pure need. And then he wants to have something else as a result. Here the result is not the split subject, but the ego ideal. And this is how we write that. This process that we're looking at here is not one of subjugation but I would say one of subjectivation, subjectivization. Bruce Fink has some good riffs on this stuff, on the difference between subjugation and subjectivation, um, I believe in the Lacanian subject book. Um, but that's a good way to understand this. The green model of the subject is one of subjugation, where the living subject is subordinated to the norms and the codes of the symbolic or social order. This might be properly um, the beginning of the field of the experience of castration. Um, and this might be a second moment in here, which we can call subjectivation. Um, here, you don't see a prohibition by the symbolic, as you do in the green. Here what you see is a positionality in the symbolic by way here of the ego ideal. So this is a really important shift that's happening here. And what you see effectively are two moments that are occurring in the experience of symbolic alienation. The first moment is one of prohibition or subjugation resulting in the formation of the superego. And the second is an experience of subjectivation, not resulting in a prohibition by the symbolic, but resulting instead in one's position within the symbolic. So the shift here is from prohibition in the green to positionality in the yellow. The green resulting in a superego, which we're going to discuss, and the yellow resulting in an ego ideal, which we're also going to discuss together. Now, what I would suggest here is that the reading we just did on page one of chapter eight, combined with the work we're doing here with our diagrams, 
it suggests that we might do something productive by adding a retroactive arrow to the topology of the subject that Lacan is working with here in seminar 16. And what we might suggest is that the purple arrow is going to comport with an understanding of S1 as the unary trait. And that our blue arrow here is going to comport with an understanding of S1 as master signifier vis-a-vis -vis the big other. So purple is the unary trait vis-a-vis -vis the split subject. Blue arrow, master signifier relative to the big other. Now we're being experimental here. I don't know if this, any of this is going to play out or how it's going to play out, but we're going to give it a try. And we're going to see how these two diagrams might comport with each other. I wonder what would happen if we were to combine the images that we were just working with. And we'll start with fresh colors to see if we can make any sense of this. If we have this earlier topology of the subject, again from the subversion of the subject essay which we've discussed, I wonder if there's some way that we could combine this with the topology of the subject we're seeing in seminar 16. Just messing around here. Now one way to think about this, as we know, is that S2 is a subset of the big other. And Lacan has been drawing this in seminar 16, kind of like this. It's some subset of the big other that's been pulled out. It's a discourse. It's a specific field of knowledge or experience. So the big other is the fantastical collection of everything. S2 here might be the collection of every Barbie doll ever made. It's a subset of the big other's absolute totality. S2 would be goaded by the, by the same um, impulse to containment <clears throat> and totality, but at the level of a specific field of discourse, we've said. Okay, now messing with this, let's go back to our white. Were we to combine these, we might say that the big other, in its selection of specific meanings in relation to the subject, results in providing the subject with some specific understandings, unary traits, if you will. And then what we could say is that these unary traits go on to inform and shape our sense of self. And what I'm here suggesting is that we have two particular ego formations that deserve our attention. The first I have symbolized by big S next to whole A, calling it the superego. This is our symbol for the superego for now. And then we also have the very familiar Lacanian notion of the ego ideal. Now, the white arrow here is a pretty useful one for us to mess with. We can even add the usual element here, signifying language, which would transform need into demand and so forth. And here is the field of the big other, of the symbolic. Here would be some specific aspect of the big other in terms of meaning of the primary caregiver, perhaps, some feature of them that would then get delivered to the barred subject in the form of a gesture, in the form of a word, in the form of a name that the barred subject then would internalize as part of themselves and specifically in two specific parts of themselves. That's what our red arrow here is indicating, or I'm sorry, our white arrow. If we were to add another one, 
sticking with the slip to red, that would capture what's happening in seminar 16 and the topology of the subject, it would be something like this. Here, the S1 is the signifier that represents this subject in all of its parts, or at least some of them, right, because it can't capture them all, to another signifier. So we're still within the logic that Lacan is working with in seminar 16. Make no mistake, what we're doing is we're, is we're mashing it up with his earlier topology of the subject in order to introduce some movement and some creativity in what's happening here in hopes that we might be able to better understand the unary trait as an element comprised of two distinct ego formations. It's a set comprised of these two entities. Let's see what we can make of this. And at the risk of causing a bunch of mischief, I'm going to simply save this diagram and start with another. Which of course is going to mean that this one disappears. What we could say as we start working through this idea of S1 as unary trait, as you've heard me say, it's a set comprised of two elements. Unary trait one. Unary trait two. And the way we're going to mess with this is to add some terms on each side. Unary trait one is going to result in the production of the superego. Unary trait two, the second element in the set, known as the unary trait, is going to result in the ego ideal. Let's see if we can flesh these things out. First, some big topics. What you're seeing here at the level of the set is a process that's going to be called symbolic identification. These two formations of the ego are going to be part of a process called symbolic identification. So that's what's happening here is the subject is being prohibited by the symbolic in unary trait one, and it's being positioned in the symbolic by unary trait two, all of which goes into the experience of being a split subject. We called this subjugation earlier. We could just say that it's a field of suppression. We called this an experience of positionality earlier, but the specific word Lacan would use here is sublimation. The superego is about prohibition, suppression. The ego ideal is about positionality and the sublimation of certain urges in order to find a more ideal outlet for them. What I would suggest also is that this set also allows us to capture what we mean when we say that the name of the father is itself comprised of two elements. There's the no of the father, and then there's the name of the father. You could think of this too as two different versions of the UN in the unary trait. The UN in each case symbolizes something slightly different. Here, you would see the UN in the German and the English sense as non, as a negation of sorts, the creation of a no thing, 
Here, though, you would see the UN in the spirit of the work we've been doing in seminar 16 in terms of the French one. Not non, but one. Someone's something. That might be a good way to understand how the unary trait works. It's some one thing that someone did that we internalized as um, an ideal signifier for what it means to be a good person or whatever it is. Some other things to add that we know about the superego. The unary trait that suppresses resulting in a superego results in a kind of unconscious pressure to avoid certain things. It's every bit a thou shalt not. That's partly what we see happening here. This is the field of the thou shalt not, of prohibition. Signifier as prohibition is what's happening over here on this side of the unary trait that the subject in here inherits. Um, on this other side, though, we don't see an unconscious pressure, but instead a highly conscious pressure. We're aware of the pressure to sublimate. Here, the imperative is not thou shalt not, but thou shalt. Here's what you should do. This is the signifier as an ideal, hence ego ideal. An ideal norm, a standard, I don't know, expectations, and increasingly connected and lined up with other signifiers. That's important here too. And the field of sublimation, you see signifiers linked up with other signifiers. In a sense, the unary trait one here that results in prohibition and suppression, it leaves an opening a lack in the subject. And it's one that we've seen symbolized in the experience of lack itself. In this, again, two element set, loss and lack in this field of castration as we've often described it. It leaves an opening in the subject. What you see over here in the field of the ego ideal is not so much an opening, but something that fills it in. It's a nice way to think about what's happening over here with the ideal signifier. It's something that fills in and takes the place of a largely invisible mark of lack that has been left in the subject by the process of prohibition. And it fills this lack in with something some one, some image of some one. Now, we can see this in a lot of different ways. Um, if we were going to map this out in terms of the two early topologies of the subject that we were just working with, one of which would end, as we saw, in a split subject, what we could say is that this is a split subject now with a superego. This is a split subject in which the cry has been subordinated to the call. We no longer cry. We now know how to call for what we want. Here is the field of prohibition, of subjugation, and the like. Out here, what we see in that same diagram, if we were to just keep charting it, you have to imagine the rest of the diagram being here is you see a split subject with, and I put it in parens for a specific purpose, with some sort of a core identification that has been forged with those ones, those little elements, those behaviors that have filled in the lack left by prohibition. And You'll recall, if we were to just go ahead and flesh this one out, that it presupposes the split subject that is a result of the first diagram. So this is a little tricky here. You have to remember where we just were and map those two topologies of the subject onto each other, knowing that 
the split subject that results in the topology of the subject known as prohibition and castration is the origin or the starting place for what's going to result in the ego ideal. And this is what you see in the early stages of the graph of desire, is that split subject slides over from the product position to the source position, allowing for the ego ideal to be the new product. And that's what you see in the bottom of the graph of desire. Split subject is in the bottom right-hand corner, and ego ideal is in the bottom left-hand corner. What we're doing is we're just marking the process whereby that happens and showing that it's linked to an understanding of the unary trait that is composite, that has two basic elements. The S1 that connects to the barred subject and represents it for another signifier as a unary trait has these two elements, these two products that result, these two experiences, and so on. We could go on discussing this, but I'm moving fast here because we have a goal. We're heading in the direction always of what Lacan's doing next in seminar 16. Let's add a few more insights here, even if we don't add to the graph. The unary trait one here that produces the superego, it begins with the subject's passage into the symbolic. It begins this passage at the stage of prohibition. Unary trait two that results in the formation of the ego ideal, it completes this passage. So unary trait one begins the passage into the symbolic at the level of prohibition. Unary trait two marks the completion of the subject's passage into the symbolic. Again, resulting in a position in the symbolic, a home in language, um, and a, a subjectivization, as Bruce Fink puts it. Here you have the field of subjugation. Here you have the field of subjectivization, as Bruce puts it. On the left side, in unary trait one, we see a prohibition against enjoyment, one that conditions repression of pre oedipal desire for the maternal figure. We don't need to go too far into that. This is precisely um, the beginning of the paternal function, the no, again, of the father here would begin the process of, rep of, of repression. And that process, as you've heard us discuss in our lectures on Seminar 3 Forward, is multi-part itself. It involves affirmation, which would be an acceptance of the, the primal prohibition here against enjoyment of a certain kind. I wouldn't call it jouissance in any regard. That would then be negated. So a negation of a negation and you can hear this also um, in our lectures on often overlooked essays in a Cree, um, available in podcast. But um, Verneinung is a negation of an earlier negation. It's a negation of prohibition that then is negated yet again in the field of repression. So the type of repression we're talking about here that would go on is one that um, is itself also multi-part, presupposing affirmation and negation before it. So. Here again, we're building on work that we've already done, which you can go back and check out. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're rocking it pretty fast here. Um, I would say in the field of uh, unary trait two with the ego ideal, um, the one that finishes or completes the positioning of the subject in the symbolic, um, one of the things that often comes up here that I think makes a lot of sense is that this would be the experience of coordinating one's gender. This is also where the gendering of a subject might occur. Not so much the sexuation of a subject that we saw in our reading of seminar 11, but a kind of gendering of the subject, which if we push on that a little bit, um, we, we could reveal all the subtleties there. The way that might sound would be something like, I now know how to call instead of just crying for what I want using the I, of course. For those of us who've been paying attention to this little I, this big I, this capital I, the I in quotation marks that Lacan is messing with here in seminar 16. Now let's add the standard riff 
on the superego, just so we know what we're dealing with here. This is a senseless, blind, tyrannical, obscene, oppressive, destructive, and keyword sadistic, censorious imperative based on, and I think this is really interesting, a kind of misunderstanding of the law, a misreading of the gaps in the symbolic, erroneously assuming that these gaps are things that need to be filled in. It's an interesting move here. This superego is, of course, as we all know, a moral agency. It's our voice of conscience. And it's a wicked, mean, sadistic voice that judges, censors, and punishes the ego time and time again. Now, there are great places to read more about this. Lacan's 1938 essay on family complexes is pretty cool. I mean, it's really early Lacan, but it's him working through the superego in relation to the ego ideal. What matters here for our purposes is that we see two aspects of S1 relative to the barred subject. And I would say that these are each um, elements of a set known as the unary trait. That's why we have unary trait one and unary trait two. Yes, the unary trait is a singular stroke, but that singular stroke is comprised of two moments that map onto these two moments of the name of the father, that also map onto the production of the superego and of the ego ideal, one of which conditions suppression and the other of which encourages sublimation Now we'll see where we go with this but for now the important part is that we've got these elements in front of us as we start thinking about this the s1 as a unary trait as lacan is inviting us to do so here in chapter eight all right having gone a bit buck wild here let's take a second and see if we can sum all this up and bring this lecture on chapter 8 and seminar 16 to a close. So previously you heard me say that the big other equals 1 plus a, 1 plus 0. Recall that statement. It's straight from chapter 8 here. That little a that is constantly being added to the one that the big other attempts to effect is a signifier of the barred other. It signals what the other cannot metabolize and integrate into its totalizing effort. Um, as we've discussed, this is something that is logically, necessarily, structurally excluded. Um, without getting back into that, let's see if we can add some more captions to this something which is nothing relative to the symbolic or the big other's totalizing account of everything. On page 13 of chapter 8, it's interesting, Lacan refers to this, as we heard, as the one of enjoyment. And then the very next page, page 14, he refers to it as the I of enjoyment. There's some sort of a correspondence between these two elements, the one and the I and the A and the signifier of the barred other. Let them all just go together for now, for now. And let's get to the question, the question that Lacan's been asking at this point. Does the I exist? He's back at this very question at the end of chapter eight, the same question he's been repeating over and over again. Does the I exist? Now, knowing what we know about the I as the one, this other one, as the little a that's being added to the oneness that the big other hopes to effect, let's see if we can answer this question in a way that is coherent and clear. From the perspective of the big other, this I does not exist. From the perspective of the big other, it is nothing. And let's be precise here. 
it is nothing relative to the big other's totalizing attempt to account for everything. Which is precisely how the I exists for psychoanalytic inquiry. This nothing relative to the big other's count of everything is itself something to be studied. Let's add some more statements, some additional captions to this in a way that syncs up some of the diagram work that we've done in this lecture into some statements. First statement, this I as an S1 represents me as a split subject to you, dear big other, as a figure of your lack, as a signifier of what you are lacking. Here, the S1 is a master signifier vis-a-vis -vis the barred other of the split subject, my perpetual absence from your, the barred other's, totalizing count. The one plus A is every bit a one plus I. Second statement, and almost like the flip side of the coin here. The I that is S1 is also how I as a split subject understand myself, qua ego, comprised of a superego, ego ideal, and let's not forget that we haven't discussed the ideal ego as well. You can find this in our earlier materials, but for now we just focused on the superego and the ego ideal. And all in response to your signifiers, dear big other, prohibitive signifiers that subjugate me and positional signifiers that subjectivate me alike. That second statement again, the I as S1 is also how I as a split subject understand myself when I show up as an ego, an ego comprised of a superego, ego ideal, ideal ego, name your ego formations, and all in response to the big other's signifiers, prohibitive and positional alike. Here, S1 is a composite set known as the unary trait, vis-a-vis -vis the barred subject that shows that this subject is subtracted radically ulterior in its relation to the ego. Going even further, my status as a split subject is what's missing from your collective identity as an absolute container, we say to the big other. And You've heard this before in this lecture, so this is a review in some ways. And the more the big other tries to encompass me as a split subject with additional signifiers, the more this horizon is revealed to be ever distant. But here's what we're adding here. My status as a split subject is also what's missing from my own sense of self, my own individual identity as an ego. And the more I attempt to counter this effect at the level of my grammatical subjectivity, at the level of self-consciousness as an ego, the more pronounced it becomes. This is what's at stake with the typology of the subject that Lacan is working on in 16 and our hybridization of this typology with Lacan's earlier typologies of the subject that become the root of the graph of desire earlier in his work. This is what we're attempting to capture. And make no mistake, the I is precisely the hinge point, the pivot point between the barred subject and the barred other. Let's pause on this and see where Lacan goes next here now that chapter nine is before us.